Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Miller, and I'm the Vice President of Impact at the James Beard Foundation. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight uh, for the one of the fourth out of the five seminar series that I've been hosting at the James at the for the James Beard Foundation and for the American University Sign Institute of Policy and Politics. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we start. I just want to thank the university and the Sign Institute for um, Policy and Politics. A very special thank you to President Sylvia Burwell, to Dean Vicki Wilkins, and to the Executive Director of Sign, Amy Dacey. Um, I also want to thank the, uh, some of the staff that makes it possible, um, Lanessa Clarkson and Charles Leggett, who sort of make this all happen, and especially since we've had to move this seminar series online. Um, you know, the original purpose of this series was to help connect the dots between food policy and personal act activism and the role of the food community. Uh, and to really start to have a conversation to identify ways that we could change the policies related to our food system so that our food system was more regenerative, more focused on workers, communities, agriculture, sustainability. My, what a difference a few weeks makes. Um, <laughs> um, I really hope that all of you are in our audience tonight are safe and healthy and well. And um, if you can be um, with friends and family, and if you can't be um, at least in contact with friends and family via video and other um, resources, um, it's not the easiest of time. And we at the James Beard Foundation and at American University know that um, the COVID-19 crisis has really put us all in a different sort of frame of mind personally and professionally. So it's, um, it's with great sort of honor and joy. And um, I'm just thrilled and grateful tonight to have three amazing business owners, chefs, activists, people I also consider friends um, here with me tonight to have a, a slightly different but still um, similar conversation about the chef's role in activism and the chef voice and how important it is at these times. Um, I'm gonna, here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna run through some introductions of our panel. Um, I'm gonna present a couple of high level facts uh, for them to consider and for you all to consider. Um, and then we're just gonna launch into a conversation. This conversation will go till right at six o'clock. Um, we have a pretty much a hard stop of that. I hope that you all will ask questions. I know the Zoom format is can sometimes be challenging, but uh, please raise, uh, put your question into the chat and Charles and the team will get it to us and we'll try and get those answered. Um, so the three folks that are with us tonight are just amazing, brilliant, fun, funny, um, talented folks, uh, all within our James Beard universe and um, come from DC and Chicago. Uh, first up tonight is Amy Brandwine uh, of Centralina. She's the owner and chef for Centralina and Piccolina. Um, one of the places that the New York Times and others call you know, one of the, the places for the most powerful women in politics to gather in DC. Um, she was named DC's Chef of the Year in 2019. She's a multi-year James Beard Award nominee. And in 2020 was named to the semi-finalist list for Best, Best Chef Mid-Atlantic. Uh, she is an amazing, um, fabulous human being. And she was also an alum of our James Beard Foundation's Women Entrepreneur Leadership Program. We are also joined tonight by Kwame Nwache, from who is the executive chef uh, and owner of Kith Kin. Uh, you may know him as that chef who flirted his way through Top Chef uh, <laughs> in 2019, uh, 2015, uh, or as a best-selling author uh, with his memoir notes from a young black chef. Last year, the James Beard Foundation recognized him as the rising star chef of the year. And lately, you've probably seen him on Fox and CNN and MSNBC and a variety of other news places talking about the economic stimulus package as one of the founding chef leaders of the Independent Restaurant Coalition that was founded in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, also with us tonight is Christine Sikowski, owner and chef from Honey Butter Fried Chicken and the Sunday Dinner Club in Chicago. Um, she is also an alum of our Women's Entrepreneur Leadership Program. And she and her business partners are consistently cited as the gold standard uh, for chef and owners for employee first operations in this industry. 
Um, she and a group of chefs in Chicago also led the grassroots move around hashtag too small to fail in the first days of the COVID crisis to raise awareness about the possible um, challenges and imminent uh, dangers for the restaurant industry. Um, all three of them are amazing chefs, owners, activists, and they all happen to be alums of our James Beard Foundation Chefs Boot Camp for Policy and Change. If you were here with us in person, I would ask you to give them a round of applause, but um, just thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, a couple of facts and a couple of things to think about before we open up the conversation. Uh, for all of you in the audience, before COVID-19, the restaurant sector was a $1 trillion industry. It represented 4% of our GDP, had over 15 million employees, including 11 million in the independent restaurant sector, of which Kwame, Christine, and Amy are um, part of, and was also supporting a local and national networks of small farmers, fishermen, and producers across this country. Um, the Good Food 100 economic study found that for every dollar a restaurant spends locally, it actually contributes between three and four to the local economy through purchasing power, employee um, benefits, taxes, and the whole gamut. Uh, this is an industry that fuels so many of us. It is the place where we've spent all of our best moments. It's where we celebrate our birthdays and our anniversaries, our promotions. It's also where we gather with friends to talk about tough times. Um, and I think for me personally, one of the most challenging things about this is not being able to join in community in restaurants um, and dine over um, really delicious meals, but also that sense of togetherness in this time. Um, and so I'll say personally for me, the world feels a bit topsy-turvy, right? Um, in less than three weeks, the independent restaurant sector is now estimated to have laid off more than half of its employees. So more than half of that 11 million folks. And we saw that today with the new jobless claims of 3.2 million people, 3.3 million people with new unemployment claims. Um, restaurants have changed their business models. They've transitioned to selling online. They're putting up GoFundMe pages to help their workers. In some cases, they're closing their doors. In some cases, they're choosing to make those business pivots so that they can stay open, so they can keep their employees um, employed and uh, make sure that those folks have paychecks coming at them. It's not a one size fits all solution for the industry and um, they're all practicing the idea of health and safety first, but there's a number of different considerations they're all making. Um, so I want to talk with these three about the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis, how they've transitioned, uh, what they're doing now in terms of either business operations uh, or what they're seeing around the industry. I want to talk about why policy action was so important for them. They all, the minute this started going the way it was going, we're in conversations with their local, state, and federal governments. Um, and what all of you as this audience, eaters and customers can um, do to help save restaurants um, so I'm just going to start and maybe Christine, I'll start with you. I just want you to tell the audience a little bit about what the last couple of weeks has been like for you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, wow. Uh, what have the last couple of weeks been like for me? At a movie? I'd say challenging. Challenging. Um, I'm going to quote my friend, Jeff Ruby, who's a food writer in Chicago. He has described it. Um, as a slow nightmare. And I think that that is pretty much what it feels like um, with moments of hope kind of sprinkled in. So um, it's just this constant feeling that something bad is happening and that we, you know, as chef and restaurant owners, we're used to like putting out fires, right? But usually it's like we put it out and then it's out and we're like, okay, there'll be another one. But this one just like never stops. So it's just sort of this, it's been a, a challenging um, to manage that personally, um, emotionally, mentally, physically, um, but professionally as well, because we are all, you know, some of us are still struggling to um, hang on to our, our restaurants and our services, but like that doesn't come without like a moral vexing, you know, it's like, are we doing the right thing? Are we being safe enough? Are we contributing? We're providing food for people and jobs, but we're also still coming to work and, and how to navigate that um, changes every day. And that is, I think, what's been the hardest part about it is that we have to adapt and change everything like every day. So it's just been, it's been uh, challenging, challenging. And Christine, you guys are still open at Honey Butter Fried Chicken now with 
the people delivery or um, yes. to go? Very, very limited uh, opening. We, we cut our hours by 60%. We're only open five days a week for dinner service from 4.30 to 8.30. Um, Wednesday through Sunday at this point that may change um, we did that very specifically so we could limit the amount of employees in the building um, and to spread out the hours so we can try to save as many jobs as we can but also mostly just so we can keep distant we're lucky at honey butter that we have like our kitchen is one room our line is one room our front of house is another room so we can keep like a few people in each room and keep everyone spread out and then we have this really big outdoor vestibule patio where we've set up like this whole system of projecting when the orders are ready so nobody comes in and it's just, yeah, we are still open, but it is very, very limited so we can control as much as possible and keep our employees safe. Yeah, and I think that's a, it's a big distinction, right? To keep the employees safe, but also keep people employed, right? And provide yeah. necessary, you know, sustenance for folks. Kwame, yeah. how you, how are you doing? Um, I've been better, for sure. You know, there's been better times I've had. Um, like to quote, you know, Kanye West, it was all good a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's just different times, you know. Um, we had to lay off all of our employees. You know, we have over 60. Our restaurants, you know, 200 seats. We do breakfast, lunch, and dinners. So we couldn't afford to just do takeout. Um, and we tried to switch up the schedule and it was only giving people like, you know, one or two shifts a week. And um, we have at risk employees, you know, we have employees that are over 60 and we didn't want to also, you know, due to gentrification, no one works right next to the restaurant. So they have to travel an hour, 30 minutes to get there. So we thought it would be best to close the restaurant to kind of curb this virus and, uh, do what we can but it wasn't easy i mean i can tell you right now i've never cried so much in my entire life uh the day that i had to sit across people and let them know that one they were losing their jobs and two i didn't know when they were coming back um you know the mayor said it, it was till april 1st and then a couple of days later it's april 27th to when restaurants can um, operate with dine-in operations so I've had some time on my hands and um, I've used that time. I can't really stay still. I'm not good at that. So um, I've used that time to really learn about what's going on, you know, and try to use my platform for something that can um, help this food system um, still be around when all this is said and done. That's amazing. Thank you. And Amy, how about you? How are you? Um, well, it's been interesting. Um, <laughs> slow nightmare, Christine, as well put. Um, you know, uh, just a few weeks ago, you know, we were in a very different place. And now, uh, you know, we have a very successful restaurant that's been pretty much decimated. So, um, you know, employees uh, that were working just a few weeks ago now are not working. Um, that's really tough. And um, we've had to change our operations completely. Um, you know, I really was struggling with the things that Christine was discussing um, as far as what's the right thing to do in this situation. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're continuing to serve our communities. And I believe very strongly in, in doing that, um, I guess, all the time. And so, uh, but it doesn't come without some kind of, you know, uh, struggle, internal struggle um, operational struggle, um, all those things. So, um, it's been a great experience in some ways, and then it's been just really, uh, really kind of brutal in others. Yeah, no, and thank all three of you for being here, because I, I know that we've been talking to chefs and restaurant owners across the country for the last three weeks, and, you know, every day is a roller coaster. Um, we have an informal saying at the James Beard Foundation that chefs know how to get mm, done. Um, and I feel like this crisis has uh, really tested all of you, the whole community, to be um, more in, uh, ingenious about your own operations, thoughtful, even more thoughtful about your staffs and your communities. And, um, and also, you know, finding some new ways to spend your found time, which is kind of what we want to talk about here you know, Christine, you and the chefs in Chicago sort of, 
you know, kicked off the first national day of action, I'll say, around the restaurant community. When at the James Beard Foundation, we were seeing folks in North Carolina and the um, Atlanta and the in California and New York and DC all doing things. But I feel like you guys really rallied around um, too small to fail and launched that. But can you talk a little bit about what how that started, what you guys did to get there and what the reaction to all of that has been and why it was important? Sure, um, it definitely started um, with a small spark. Um, uh, Jason Vincent, uh, who owns a restaurant, restaurants uh, giant and, and chef special, I think was kind of communicating with Jason Hamill who owns Lula Cafe and a couple of other chefs about this tragedy that was unfolding before our eyes and um, organized uh, just a meeting of a few chefs to sort of get together and talk about it. Um, and I somehow ended up on an email list to somebody forwarded it to me. I don't even remember who. And they're like, you should come to this meeting. And so I was like, yeah, I'll go, you know, it's before my shift. And I showed up not really knowing what to expect. And there were 75 people there. Um, my colleagues from this, from the city, people I hadn't seen in a really long time. Um, but I talked to all the time and just like every major restaurant owner in Chicago, uh, and chef was gathered, um, appropriately spaced out. <laughs> but, um, we, I had no idea that it was going to swell to that size. And I, at that meeting, um, kind of under the leadership of, of both of those Jason's um, and Rick Bayless and Paul Kahan um, kind of established that we needed to speak up um, as one voice. That was very, very apparent to us by the end of that meeting that um, if we were gonna ask the governor and the mayor to help us, um, which is exactly what we needed them to step in and help us, um, that we were going to have to put out some sort of campaign um, and some ask Right, and we had determined um, at that meeting that we were going to do it all at the same time. We were going to have the same message and the same images. So Stephanie Izzard and I worked on uh, images and um, timing the campaign and organizing it. And basically we just had an email group together um, and we started a Facebook page and we said, hey, here's the images, here's the message. Everybody post it tomorrow at 12 o'clock and um, we decided to publicly do it. I think that that was sort of the key to our success as opposed to just going right to our representatives. We posted to them through social media um, in such a, a critical mass um, style that the public was also involved. And I think that that is really what helped us gain their ear um, for that campaign. It was very effective. Um, they what were, were you asking them, Christine? What were you asking the governor and the mayor for? Um, well, a lot of things, really. Mostly <laughs> like <laughs> cash. <laughs> um, I would say relief stimulus is probably the best way to encapsulate everything, and that is um, unemployment benefits, um, lifting the amounts of benefits, making it faster and easier for people to get unemployment, rent abatement, um, utility holds. I mean, everything that you can imagine that a business um, that's having to shut down or seriously go into downturn would ask for. Um, I think we asked for like 10 things. <laughs> um, and um, slowly we started to get some responses, like by the end of the day saying the governor's heard you. Um, we've been in contact with people from the mayor's office. They've heard you. Um, and I know that they've been working on funding. Um, and this was actually before uh, Illinois um, instituted the stay at home ban, um, the stay at home order. So um, now we obviously have that, which was, which was helpful. Um, but yeah, they were listening to us and um, definitely are making some, there's some movement on some of those things. I know that they've been talking about freezing rents, um, utilities have been frozen. Um, there is a bunch of organizations um, throughout Chicago um, with the support of the city that are actually providing cash funding. Um, cash relief to workers. Um, so they, they definitely did listen um, and they're working on things. That's, that's basically what I can No, describe. no, I love it. I think, you know, one Funding of the things- Funding and there's grants and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not enough. It, I don't know if it ever will be enough. I'm sure Kwame can speak about that too because um, he's been working on the federal, um, the federal side of things. Um, but I will say the momentum that we got and the, um, community um, collective 
force that came out of that um, is very, very powerful. And we decided that we wanted to um, keep going with it and do a national call to action. Um, and that was really special. The, uh, myself and my business partner, Josh, Stephanie Izzard, Rick Bayless, Paul Kahan, Jason Vincent, Jason Hamill, um, and Ben Lusbader put together our second campaign. Shout it out to all the Chicago chefs. And that was where we really started Too Small to Fail. Um, sent it out to uh, every single chef that we all personally knew and asked them to forward it on. And I'm pretty sure that it got, um, I think something like over 10,000 shares. Which yeah, no, it was good. it was amazing to see it shared and it was really inspirational. And I think, you know, the lessons that we at Beard tried to collect for you guys on a, we did a big national conference call with like 3000 people on it. We crashed, you know, go to webinar. Um, but those were the pieces, right? One message, one voice and in concrete ask that you were all asking for. And Kwame, right. those were exactly the sort of lessons that you guys took into the um sort of takeover of Save Restaurants and the work of the Independent Restaurant Coalition. You want to talk about that work a little? Yeah, I mean, it was really about, uh, you know, we started the Independent Restaurant Coalition so we can have a voice that can go directly to uh, senators and representatives. You know, we used our contacts. You know, I have a lot of senators, representatives, and mayors that come into the restaurant in D.C. since I'm right there. And a lot of my colleagues have that as well. And, you know, we had, we put together a couple missions so we can go in and really focus on something um, and get that into the bill. So we're focusing on the stimulus, um, you know, package, the, the CARE Act. Um, and we had like four really, really important things that we really wanted to hit, which was four months of unemployment payments for workers expanding loans to local restaurants and forgiveness to cover expenses and payroll, coverage of independent restaurants up to a 500 employee limit per restaurant, and then coverage of independent restaurants that began closing and laying off workers as early as February 15th. Um, you know, and our main mission also was just to bring awareness that, you know, the restaurant industry, you know, we attribute to $1 trillion in the economy. You know, we employ uh, you know, 13 million people. Um, so we need, and I don't even want to call it a bailout because we didn't do anything wrong, you know, but we need our own carved out lane in that stimulus package of at least $150 billion to get us off the ground. And that's just for rents, that's for our utilities. Um, that's not even talking about our employees that we need to take care of as well. So um, that's what the coalition really stands for. And, um, you know, we, we've made a lot of strides, but we still need to continue to push on um, and get this thing signed. Yeah, and no, Amy, I saw your voice all over social supporting Too Small to Fail, Save Restaurants, Save F&B. Why did you think it was important for you to sort of speak up um, around all of this stuff at this time? Well, I mean, if people don't hear your voice, they're not gonna do anything. So, I mean, I wasn't sure who was listening to me, but I was gonna make sure that I was heard um, because the more people that talk, the more people take, pay attention. And it's just as simple as that. Plus, I mean, um, it's just the right thing to do. I mean, you know, um, how we got here, you know, well, we could talk about that for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's just very important to speak up for what's right and speak up to um, fix the situation. And staying staying silent is not going to accomplish much right now. Yeah, no, it was it was so amazing. I mean, within a period of sort of that three weeks, you know, these um, movements all over the country arose. We saw you know the hashtags and social media taking off. We saw Congress and the governors and the mayors around the country really listening. And um, it's amazing to hear people be able to people that don't work in the restaurant industry to be able to talk about how it is this trillion dollar driver, um, how it is part of this ecosystem that's so important. You know, we did a snap survey of our members uh, just about a week ago to ask what the barriers were going to be for restaurants to reopen. And we know that it's incredibly large. And so that figure, Kwame, of like 150 billion is in some ways a drop in the bucket, right? 
that's a couple of months of operating expenses for all of the restaurants and farmers and producers in this. Uh, most of the folks that we heard from said they were going to need at least between $25,000 and $50,000 to stay open or to keep their staffs on payroll for the next three to six weeks, and that they may need as much as $250,000 to reopen when this is all open, you know, whether it be to pay back bills or, you know, all the things that have been deferred or delayed in these great activism, you know, activist pieces. And so it is really a big financial, um, a big financial picture and ask, um, you know, Kwame, are you happy with the, what the first results out of the IRC work has been so far? Yeah, um, I think we've made progress, you know, um, but we need to, one, you know, First and foremost, I want to thank the senators that did listen and um, implemented the the goals that we had listed. Um, but we need to get this thing signed, and we need to see how it looks after it gets reviewed for the second time. Um, so I'm I'm happy, you know. I'm hopeful, you know. And that's also long term. I'm also thinking about the staff right now, you know, especially the staff that lives paycheck to paycheck. Um, about you know rent abatement for on, on a residential level and a rent freeze on a residential level, and I know that that's from state to state. Um, those are state to state conversations or districts for you know where I'm at, but um, that's important. You know we need to really think about those people. We need to think about the people that may have had a little bit of money saved up, but now they have their kids at home and now they have to feed them three times a day, and they didn't really account for that. So you know I think. On a large scale, if we look at these Fortune 500 companies that are now asking for a bailout because they don't have profit for two weeks, but you know the day-to-day -day worker is really thought of, and they should have these um, crazy amounts of savings. Uh, and if the Fortune 500 companies don't have it, I guarantee you, the average American doesn't have it either. So um, you know we need to be thinking about it on all levels. Yeah, no, it was an amazing sort of a, a thing that I heard from a bunch of folks was how difficult and what people don't realize about the restaurant industry is how slim the margins are and the operating costs, but also how many of you are paying tomorrow's bills today mm -hmm. um, so that you can pay your suppliers, you can pay your farmers for things. Um, and so that that, that is a, a real, a really big impact. Kwame, you raise a, a thing that I want to get to and maybe Amy, I'll start with you. How are your farmers doing? How are, I mean, are you seeing, are they calling you and saying help? I mean, how, how are your suppliers and your farmers and your fishermen doing at this time too? Yeah, I mean, it's frustrating because uh, my experience so far is that, you know, they want to sell, but there's, there's no one to buy the products. So it's kind of heartbreaking, you know? I mean, I was talking to one of my fishmongers and I said, well, what's going to happen to all these, you know, all these, uh, you know, these fishers, you know, and they said, well, I said, are they going to keep fishing? I mean, I was just like wondering how all this works, you know, and they're like, well, yeah, they will. But I mean, at a certain point, like if there's nothing to, you know, there's no customers out there, what are they going to do? And then, so you realize how inter interconnected all this really is, not that we didn't know it before, but now we realize how fragile the system really is. I mean, um, what we do if we're able to sustain ourselves and we're able to stay in business or able to buy, you know, that affects economies all over the place. So um, what I'm hearing is basically that in my particular situation is that there is food to buy and they're very happy that I'm buying it. Um, but I think it, it creates a lot of nervousness about a glut of supply and yeah. what are they going to do about it? You know, I, you know, Kwame and Christine, I was thinking about you guys. I was thinking about your goat roti and, you know, the poor guy who's so used to you buying goat after goat and Christine, your chicken folks, right? Like with that drop and those supply. Kwame or Christine, you guys want to talk about that a little, like the impact on your suppliers? Some of my suppliers are hurting. Some of them aren't, just to be honest, because a lot of them also provide to a supermarket. So like we're at the bottom of their totem pole. Um, ah. So like... Some of them were like, you know, what can we do to help? Because we've lost the restaurants, but like the grocery stores that we supply are 10 times as much. So it, it depends on the supplier. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm starting to see a lot more D'Artagnan chicken breasts at my local grocery store, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so they're, they're switching who they're selling to, really. Um, they, they have protein, they have vegetables, and 
you know, there are people out there cooking at home a lot more. I gave myself a fade this morning, so I'm pretty sure like the, the other industries are being affected um, as well. But people at home are going to start to figure out how to people are start going to start to figure out how to do a, a lot of things themselves in this time. Oh, yeah. No, well, Valdar well, Specialty Foods is now selling to homes. And I was so excited about it until I realized I was going to have to buy 50 pounds of <laughs> um, bone marrow, you know, uh, bones for bone marrow. Or... cases for anyone. Not yeah, either. right? <laughs> I was like, oh, my goodness. Christine, how are your farmers and suppliers? Um, well, I think we're in the same boat as Kwame, like the the distributors that we're getting that are bigger, that also supply grocery stores are you know, obviously concerned. Um, we're really lucky that we've been able to still get most of our product in. And um, but the the farmers, the the smaller farmers that we we bought from, um, we aren't able actually to buy much from them now because we've reduced our menu um, and our hours so much that we don't we just can't do it. And we we're very concerned about them. Although I will say. Um, I just read that the Green City Market, where all the farmers sort of convene um, and they can buy from, chefs can buy and also the public, has started to offer delivery service um, to the public, which is super um, hopeful. Um, and I think some of our other farmers been working with Spence Farm um, usually sends out a big list for chefs, has started to send it out to the public and some restaurants are donating their spaces um, as drop off points um, for the farmers so people can actually come and get the food. So um, while I think that the downturn, the economic downturn for farmers is concerning, there is a little bit of hope there. Um, and them having to, kind of similar to Amy, having to um, you know, move their operations in a, in a way that is like, move, move them to a different direction very fast. Um, but some of them are adapting and it is um, encouraging to see and I hope that they're okay. I hope they will be okay. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, I've been so impressed with the sort of innovative way that chefs have moved. I mean, you guys have been feeding your, um, the restaurant workers who might typically have depended on family meal and then the work that the Lee Initiative and those guys are doing in different um, cities. I mean, Kwame, I know you, when you, you know, were closing down, Kith and Kin did some stuff for your team. You guys have been doing, um, continuing to turn your restaurants into grocery stores for folks. I've seen that around the country. The innovation has been pretty crazy. And I would encourage our audience, and I hope one, if they have questions, oh, we're starting to get some questions, great. Um, and, you know, is also to buy, C you know, sign up for that CSA that you thought you wouldn't normally have signed up for, right? There are different ways to support our farmers and suppliers. Um, keeping on that, um, we do have a question, and so I'm gonna skip around a little, but there's a question from Wendy. Um, is the model at all realistic of becoming a corner grocery so that you can connect the products from your suppliers with consumers so some can cook at home? And maybe Kwame, I know you're doing some recipes on Instagram, so maybe I'll ask you to talk about that. And you know, can you even try and cook one of your special dishes or with instructions um, to teach people how to do, use the products at home? And Kwame, you've been doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. So like, I, I mean, I cook three times a day and I'm trying to just stay busy and continue, I don't know, using my hands, you know? So I figured why not let everyone into my kitchen? I'm also trying to eat healthy because it's really, really easy to sit and eat a whole tray of Oreos, you know, while watching Love is Blind or something on Netflix. I'm uh, totally trying to avoid the other COVID-19, like the freshman 15. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so eating clean is something that I am, near and dear to my heart so I just show people how to make recipes really quick and it's only like 15 minutes it's nothing super long I post a recipe a day ahead of time so then you can get the groceries and then cook along with me um so yeah I mean I, I, I see a lot of other chefs doing that I think we're just trying to stay busy and um use our talents for something yeah, Amy, there's a, that's amazing. And I, I'm going to sign my husband up for your cooking class online. Um, Amy, this is probably a question maybe for you and Kwame, if you've got any ideas, but Amy, are there some farmers or suppliers that people in the audience can actually buy from that you know now who they could buy from a CSA or um, vendors that will home deliver anybody? Any suggestions of farms you want to support? Is DC Greens doing stuff? Um, well, I think they're in hibernation right now. Um, but you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, 
I'm sorry, I've just been super busy. No, that's okay. <laughs> Do what I'm doing, but um, you know, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that uh, that could use support. So, uh, you know, we carry food from um, Maryland, you know, Virginia, Pennsylvania, um, in the market right now. Um, and so, uh, speaking to your speaking to your point, you know, we have a grocery store that's been in existence since I opened. Um, and we often have uh, customers who try to replicate the dishes at home. So, you know, it's really important to reinforce that. And so, um, you know, gosh, I don't know. I haven't been to the farmer's market lately. I'll, I'll be honest. I haven't been there a few weeks, but um, I'm no, sure. Look at, it, it's I'm totally sure there's fine. Tons of farmers out there there's tons want, of farmers. And, you know, yeah. if you guys, Kwame and Amy and Kwame, I know you got to want to break in here for a second, but if you guys think of folks off this, we can also post a line, an online um, list of folks that you like or that we can send out after because it is that it's coming out from the audience. Um, and, you know, I would say that you, Amy, you've got the Centralina Mercado open um, where people can buy stuff too. And a lot of that is from small farmers and producers, but Kwame, anybody you want to give a shout out to? Um, I know that Chef's Garden, you know, something that I use and most rest, a lot of restaurants use for micros or small vegetables and no restaurants are open right now. So they're doing Chef's Garden at home and they also do a lot of other vegetables. So really beautiful carrots and brassicas and potatoes and whatever, whatever you can think of um, that's within season. You know, you don't need micro cilantro at home, so I'm not saying buy that, but there is vegetables that you can use that normally aren't available to the public that they'll deliver straight to your house and it's shipped, so you don't have to worry about coming in contact with anybody, so. Yeah, no, and it's it's interesting, like a lot, we were joking about it, but D'Artagnan chicken breasts or Baldor specialty foods or Chef's Garden, these are um, people who are, you know, probably more known for supplying restaurants at really high end, but because of the downturn in restaurant purchasing, all that stuff is now being made available to, you know, sort of your um, home, adventurous home cook. And just a shout out from the audience that fresh farm farmers markets are still open in DC um, and they're getting, they're working on getting the full season markets open all the way to April. They'll have a lot of um, things in place to protect folks. And um, so just as an FYI, Jillian, Julian O'Donno, uh, Donahue. Um, Christine, you know, I'm going to switch gears a little and I'd love to hear from all three of you because this is both a question on my list, but also one from the audience is what can people do to help local restaurants right now? I mean, in the early days, it was all, you know, keep coming and then it was no, you know, take out, then it was, you know, to go, then it was gift cards, it was buy cookbooks. I feel like it's all of those things I need to do, but Christine and starting with you, like what, what can people do to help right now? All your senators and representatives. Call the switchboard. Call the switchboard. I would call the switchboard. Honestly, I think that um, you know we we love the support of of having people buy gift cards from our restaurant. Please don't stop doing that. It's helping us um, and merch and all that stuff is great. But the most important thing right now is that the public um, voice their concern. Um, and demand that um, leadership um, provides relief for restaurants. And, I, and, and that's, a, that's a big ask, but it's also not a, a, a huge one in the sense that it's a phone call. You know, it's an email. Like, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, but I would say be educated about what's going on in the world right now and, um, and really demand that support is given to the places that you love to eat at. Because they might not be here when you uh, when we get through this, and I think that we can only do so much as chefs. We have a tremendous voice um, that people listen to, but um, we need the voters to come out and support us and and call their call your senators and representatives, please. Thank you. Uh, no, and if you want to call your senators or congressmen, you can go to saverestaurants.co um, and they will give you, there's talking points up there from the federal side on the stuff that Kwame was talking about and the capital switchboard for those of you who don't know it is 202-224-3121. Um, and so um, they can patch you through to your member of Congress. Uh, there's also a toolkit on jamesbeard.org that lists all the social media handles of every member of Congress as well as the telephone numbers for all of their home and district offices. So if you're looking for those tools and you don't quite have 
them. We have them up on our jamesbeard.org uh, website. And But again, the Capital Switchboard is 202-224-3121. Um, I feel like I'm on radio. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing that other people can do, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Like legitimately stay home. Um, you know, some of us are still open for pickup and, and curbside pickup and delivery, um, but we but but we can't push that system, right? Like we've limited the amount of orders we're taking. We're intentionally like we could do more sales than we are actually allowing us to do. Um, don't push the system. Like, yes, obviously, if you need to order takeout and delivery, we will take the support. But like, stay at home and cook. And the more people that stay home, the more uh, the faster we will actually be able to get back up and running. It's like that. That's that's don't don't go out unless you have to. Don't push the systems that are already the essential services. Like get what you need, but like don't, don't go, don't just stay home. Please. Um, Kwame, we got a question um, that I'm gonna let you answer and I can chime in if, um, which uh, people just want you to reiterate what the stimulus bill has in it for restaurants. So uh, just to break it down to like four, quick points, uh, four months of unemployment payment for workers, expanded loans to local restaurants and forgiveness to cover expenses uh, and payroll. There's coverage of independent restaurants for up to $500 employee limit per restaurant. Uh, coverage of independent restaurants that began closing and laying off as early as February 15th. Um, there's a bunch of other things in there as well. Um, whether that's the Paycheck Protection Program, um, which focuses on flexible loan to cover like operating expenses, like loan forgiveness, incentives to rehire, um, and waiving application fees for all of these things. So if you go to saverestaurants.co, there's a full list of everything that we worked on and what's happening. But those are some of the key points right now that we've been working towards. Yeah, and I think just to reiterate something, you know, the purpose of the in Independent Restaurant Coalition kind of doing this and also the work that, you know, Christine and her cohort, cohort and, you know, that Amy's been involved in and is really to help those independent restaurants get those 11 million people back to work, right? Everybody here wants to go back to work. Everybody here wants to go back to work um, in a time, in a way that is safe um, for the country. Um, but, you know, ultimately, as this crisis passes over the next couple of months, getting all those businesses into shape. And that means also the tens and millions of more Americans that are the farmers and the fishermen and the linen services and the florists and the cleaners and the beverage distributors, right? Um, Amy, you know, and I would love to hear from all of you on this, but Amy, just to bring you in here a little, um, this is kind of a fun question from the audience is that because chefs are so creative, how are you kind of keeping your creative juices going at this time and uh, you know keeping that keeping that sort of turned on so that you're able to use it when you um, when you're fully back up and functional essentially you know, you're also creative like how are you keeping those creative juices flowing um, such a good question I mean I have been very creative in the last few weeks um, in terms of you know God, your business I mean, we created like several meal packages that didn't exist before. Um, gosh, I mean, you know, we've, uh, I mean, I've brought back menu items I haven't done in 10 years, uh, because it's something that the customers want. So I think it's, you know, creativity is, uh, in different forms. I think right now it's being nimble and being able to adapt. Um, so no, I haven't been, you know, cooking up, I haven't been thinking of any new dishes that I'm going to launch when the restaurant fully reopens yet. But in terms of um, being creative, meaning problem solving, um, teamwork, um, you know, this has been an incredible experience for all of us to come together um, inside the restaurant with our employees um, and kind of reconnect. And I think that that alone, when we reopen again fully, will be just incredible. So I think creativity is like actually seeing what's out there and connecting all the dots. And Christine, yeah, you're nodding. Yeah, same. <laughs> same. I, I, I feel like, um, you know, mostly what I've been doing the last couple of weeks is 
um, emailing and doing social media, which is very <laughs> a strange a strange thing to do um, to focus on full time as a chef. Um, but I think um, at home, I don't really cook a lot, weirdly enough, and I've cooked more in the last week than I probably have in years, um, which has been great. And and not doing anything sort of new. Weirdly, I'm like going back to things that I used to eat like 10 years ago. I made a batch of chocolate chip cookies for the first time in my own house um, like in like 10 years. So I think- um, Well, it's that's such a funny- not, no, that's such a great point because so, the three of you, especially, you you walk the line, you do the expediting, you make sure that stuff looks great, right? You make sure the staff is doing it. But a lot of you don't cook on a daily basis, right? And now you get to do it again. Same thing. And, and really um, trying very hard. I mean, I always try hard not to waste food, but like, I feel like I'm obsessed with like oh, my yeah. creative energy <laughs> is <laughs> <Quite honest. laughs> nothing. My creative energy is is more focused on like, I don't want to go to the grocery store. I have enough food. Like, how can I make this last? And how can I not waste anything in a way and on a level that is um, much higher than anything I've experienced yet? With so yeah, Kwame, you're sort of nodding. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many bags of pureed cauliflower and broccoli stems I have in my freezer <laughs> right now that I add to my smoothies because. I'm like we can't throw this away. So, so someone is hungry right now. Like I'm just like so obsessed with everything. So um, I'm trying to stay busy by just learning about what's going on and just how I can help. I mean, I'm also like writing a book, another book right now. So I have that on my plate um, and trying to also use this time to kind of reset as well because I think we always think of ourselves last you know, um, as chefs and restaurant operators, I know myself, I'm always like running a hundred miles a minute. So like now I'm able to kind of like take a breath, um, get some sleep a little bit and also use my platform for something that's bigger than me. Um, just our, our industry in general. Yeah. I have a question. I, I don't know if, if this is true in DC. Thank you for that. All three of you. Um, we have a question from the audience about working with local governments to get approval for different things in this time, such as takeout alcohol or other things that required a regulatory change. Christine, was that something that you guys were looking for in Chicago or are you guys doing takeout alcohol or delivery? I know yeah. some places are doing that. I, it's amazing how quickly they let that, that, uh, let that go. <laughs> like they were, I, I, it happened. It sound, it felt like overnight. It was like all of a sudden, we could sell alcohol via delivery uh, and takeout with like very little. Why can't we do that all the time? Now? I know that is what is really starting to get me. What the hell? Well, so this is that's all a that's a follow up. All that's of a stuff that's happened so fast, <laughs> like ev eviction freezes for people who can't pay their rent. I'm like, so if you could do it that fast, yeah. How like how how have we not been able to to make this like unemployment um, usually is paid out at a lower rate and all of a sudden it's able to be paid out at 75% and no in-person interviews. I'm like, yeah. so you could do it now. How come you couldn't do it before? Yeah. So it's been very encouraging um, to see this happen. And I'm curious to see um, how businesses and the public will demand that those, those um, social services essentially to be I'm keeping takeout margaritas, damn yeah, it. I am right? keeping takeout margaritas, <laughs> right? That's Which is a thing here in New York. Amy, you've got a bar program <laughs> at Central Lena too, right? Like that people can come buy wine, right? Yeah, we've uh, launched a number of specials. One of them is Fakasha and Martini. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, this has been incredible. I mean, the, the, the speed at which people are allowing people to, generate income is like incredible. And um, yeah, I mean, I think like one of the takeaways of all this is how I just think that we, the people out there need to think about um, this industry as being so capital intensive um, with such small margins and employing so many people. And, you know, no one ever really cared about the restaurant industry. They were just consumers, you know? Um, but now it's sort of like people realize like how important it is um, to the local economy, you know? And um, 
that's why they're, I mean, they need this, they need the sales tax, you know, yeah. so they need that revenue. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're act. That's why they're acting so fast because they realize how important this industry is to their local economy. And that is actually encouraging because that alone gives us a lot more power, you know, that people didn't realize how much power we actually had until we had to actually, you know, try to use it. Yeah. No, I, I want to get a couple more questions in here and just be conscious of the fact that we do have a hard stop. And so we just have a few more minutes. But I mean, keeping on that point, uh, one of the questions, so there are a couple of really um, big questions around the specifics around the stimulus loans and paybacks and that kind of stuff. We'll post some resources here to the Sign Institute that answer those. Uh, for all of us who are following the federal legislation, like it is a blur right now. There are um, a thousand pieces of pieces of stuff to go through. There's a lot of technical stuff. So um, I'm gonna we'll take the questions around that offline and provide some resources so that folks can um, have the best uh, and most up to date information. Um, there's a question about which sort of builds off that one around alcohol and how quickly all this stuff changed. Once things are back to the new normal, whatever that might be, what changes do you want to see stay? that you've had to make? You want to keep alcohol bar sales? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't personally see why we can't, you know, sell bottles of wine for delivery. I mean, I, I don't I don't see why that's such a dangerous thing with a meal. Yeah. You know? and, and in terms of generating revenue for restaurants, it's huge. You know, um, I think I would love to see that stay. I don't see anybody being harmed so far that I've heard of. So, um, <laughs> I mean, that would help out, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Christine, anything you want to keep once we're back to the new normal from a business standpoint? I think um, what I would love to see stay is um, the general concern and, uh, uh, and welfare of our staff. Um, Amanda Cohen wrote a great op-ed in the New York Times about um, how people are going to have to start caring about their workers you know, I mean, obviously all of us are on this call, take care of our teams and um, provide them with the services and benefits and things that they need, but not everyone does that. And I think people are paying attention now and realizing how vulnerable their workers are and how vulnerable their business is. So what I would like to see stay and grow and expand is that this is something that happens for everybody, that there are, there are measures and legislation in place to make sure that workers are taken care of, paid properly, that benefits are available. Um, because if we don't have them, we don't have restaurants. So that's that's what I want. That's amazing. Um, just a couple more, two more things. One is what what's the one thing that's kind of given you hope during this really difficult time? Is there one person or one organization or one thing that's happened that's just made you go, okay, it's gonna be okay. And I, I'll just say my employees, you know, um, the resilience they've shown throughout the last couple of weeks, um, the amount of care that is coming from people who are not working right now, people who are so appreciative of everything that we're doing to try to get everything up back up and running. That is the thing that just has been, it wasn't surprising, but when it came out the way it did, it was so meaningful. Yeah. Kwame? I have to agree. You know, I think um, I remember when I was sitting there talking to my employees and letting them know that we were going to be closing. I was choking up, you know, saying those words. And then when they're asking, like, when are we coming back? And I'm like, I don't know. And I started to cry in front of my staff, which I'm usually, you know, have to be stoic and um, hide all of that. And they came around and just patted me on the back. I'm like, it's not your fault. Like, we're all in this together. You know, we, we hung on as long as we could. So we'll be here when it's time to open back up, you know. And that gave me hope to continue going um, and just continue to look on the bright side and understand that we're all in this and we're going to get through this and we're going to be stronger after this as well. Christine? Same. Yeah, <laughs> same. Nice continually, um, particularly our management team that has been um, strong for us um, when we couldn't be. You know, I, I probably struggled more uh, in my leadership role than the last week than I ever have in my entire career to stay strong and, and having the support of my team 
um, to help me make the best decisions and, and say, you know what, we're okay to stay open. We're going to keep working. We're going to feed the public and watch them um, transform our restaurant in a way that feels healthy and safe has been great. But I would also say that I am, I'm, I'm um, continually amazed at our, my colleagues work um, on, on state, local and, uh, and uh, nationwide efforts to make change, um, making it like their full-time job to go on CNN and talk about this stuff and, and demand it. It's, it's really, I think all of us kind of struggle with this question all the time. It's like, I, am I doing enough? Could I be doing more? And I think we're all playing our part. And I think the power of the collective is, is, is very strong. And that is giving me a lot of hope right now. No, no, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I have two kind of rapid fire things and I want you guys to answer them quickly. One is a sort of fun one for you. Everybody's trapped at home. Everybody's at home. Qu lots of questions about how do I reduce food waste? So what's a one tip related to food waste, um, reduction of food waste? Kwame. <laughs> um, reduction, one tip, plan when you go shopping. Don't just go shopping hungry and say like, oh, this looks good. I want to get that. This looks good. And you're buying like fresh produce and then you come home and you forgot that you already had a box of spinach that, you know, now is spinach soup already in, you know, three yeah. more days. So it's like plan your shopping, create, create a list um, and then freeze things when they're on their way out, when they're close to being done. You know, yeah. I have bags of bananas that are, that turned a little bit of brown that I could throw into a smoothie. I have you know, herbs that I've frozen that can go into a sauce. So make okay. sure that you freeze things as well. Now, planning ahead, especially in these days, is really important, right? It also minimizes our time out and about. Amy, one tip about food waste, quick. Just use what you have. Create, try to create things from what you have instead of trying to go out and, you know, create new recipes. Try to use what you have. Yeah. Christine? Waste not frittata. Waste not for time. I like whatever vegetables are, I have are, are laying around. I uh, just saute up and make it into a frittata and eat it for breakfast for a couple of days. Awesome. Don't, don't complicate it too much. Just make frittata. <laughs> just make frittata. And uh, one more quick round. What's something that everybody on this call can do to help you or folks um, during this time? What can we do to help our local restaurants? Amy? Oh, I think we already talked about it. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, calling Congress and not, I mean, it does take five minutes, if that, so. Yeah. That's Call Congress. Yeah. Kwame? Call Congress. Call Congress. Christine? Call those people. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so the Congressional Switchboard again is 202-224-3121. You can go to saverestaurants.co, .co, not .com, .co, saverestaurants.co for information on how to get involved with the Independent Restaurant Coalition. You can follow the hashtag Save Restaurants and Too Small to Fail for um, inspiration on social um, you can visit the James Beard Foundation, jamesbeard.org, and we have a whole ton of resources up for your advocacy purposes. Um, six o'clock. It's, it's six o'clock, absolutely. Um, we are wrapping the one Sorry, that's my computer. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's perfect. It's, <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was Charles, our producer. Um, no, it is six o'clock, and we do have a hard stop. But I want to pass on some sentiments from um, the audience who said. Um, just want to thank the chefs and say that even as the culture, more of us learn to cook and cook in a more widespread way at home, which is not a bad thing. We love our restaurants and miss you and hope to see you on the other side of this. And I think that is a perfectly fitting way to say thank you for using your voice to make sure that there's an independent restaurant community um, that can be see the other side of this. Thanks for all you're doing to keep us health, healthy and safe and fed during this time and thank you for using your voice. So I thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Right. Thanks guys. <laughs>